Hello, everyone. <clears throat> so in the last video, we sort of uh, talked about um, Anaximander's cosmology and cosmogony. And uh, actually, one thing that I did miss talking about there was uh, that there is an idea of innumerable worlds that is attributed to Anaximander. Um, and this new innumerable, innumerable worlds or heavens, you know, cosmoi or uranoi, um, it is the idea of, well, it could be, you know, there are two, two interpretations. One is that there was a succession of different worlds in time. The other could be the idea of the coexistence of a crowd of different worlds in the Aperon, right? Well, so th there are two versions. One of them is that, you know, there is a separating out and then it's like, you know, the, the things come together and things go out and then things come together and things go out. And, and so, you know, you have like constant sort of struggle and war, which means in time, you will have an infinite number of worlds that are being born and that perish. And the other vision is that in the Aperon, which is spatially infinite, you have an innumerable number of worlds that, uh, you know, are born and perish in different parts of the Aperon, let's say. Both of these, you know, there are people who argue for one or the other. There are people who argue against both, <laughs> right? And there are people who argue, you know, well, in that sense. So you, you'd have, there, there is nothing that gives us like very certain knowledge. Theophrastus actually says that Anaximander had, um, you know, an, an infinite number of worlds. We do know that Atomis, the Atomis definitely had the idea of innumerable number of worlds. And it could be that, you know, because the Atomis had so many similarities in some ways, you know, not, not complete similarities, but the atomist arguments might have been applied to Anaximander to create the idea of um, innumerable worlds. So you have, you know, an idea of innumerable worlds um, with, um, um, <clears throat> with the atomist applied to Anaximander, or you might have had innumerable worlds in Anaximander. You know, I think it's pretty cool that, you know, to, to um, think of, um, already this kind of a, of a idea, it's, it's pretty startling and dazzling, you know, to like that, that our world is not the only one, you know, our earth is not the only sort of place in, in the world, uh, which we do have with Atomis, but, you know, possibly with an accident, you know, we could give him more or less credit for things, we don't know. So, uh, and, um, so we talked uh, earlier about um, the separating out of um, of different elements of um, you know of, um, of and and the formation of the world and Earth and the Earth has a cylinder suspended in the middle. But the, where did animal and human life come from? So there was a continuation, let's say, of the same process of separating out, and then in the same process of separating out, then life arose as this moist element um, through the action of the sun's warmth, right? So through the action of, um, so th th there's an idea of life being generated spontaneously. And in fact, you know, if you think about it even now, we don't really have that much of a very clear idea of the beginning of life, you know, how did life begin? So, you know, this might as well be, you know, one of the hypotheses that we, we hold on to is the idea of spontaneous generation. Now, what kind of spontaneous generation? So what he would say is that the life arose in the moist element. So again, you know, the same sort of Homeric Hesiodic idea of, and Homeric especially of, you know, the moist being the generation of things. In that, you know, the moist and the warm, right? The sun's warmth. So the idea that, you know, something warm could spontaneously allow life to be generated. And um, very interestingly for us, because the idea is that life generated from the moist, what he said was that, you know, originally man resembled, well, we don't know. Did he resemble a fish or was he inside a fish? Now, again, there's this idea of this, the, that human beings were, of course, they, you know, like um, the, the idea was that the originally human beings would not have been adapted uh, to the universe to um, be able to um, survive in it in the form that they have right now. So, uh, and, and also, you know, given that the earth was much more moist, you know, because it's still drying out and there was much more water. And so um, the idea was that human beings were gestated inside the fish and the fish again surrounded the humans like a bark around a tree. He loved this idea of bark around a tree, right? So they were born in the fish and nurtured inside the fish. 
uh, till they then, you know, we could use the word evolved carefully out here, till they evolved to take care of themselves. You know, an alternative reading, you know, bringing him closer to our modern conceptions of evolution, could be that originally human beings resembled fish, and as humidity sort of, you know, evaporated, as, you know, they, they, they were pushed out to the dry land, they had to adapt and adapted to form these bodies. Now, this is a bit more far out with the Anaximander, but you can already see this idea of humans not being in the same form, right? You know, like even if we were in the fish, we were then then in this this sort of different space out here. So, so there is this very very interesting notion of you know the origin of animal and human life, um, which which we can see in Anaximander. Uh, now, apart from you know, the, you know, biology and uh, sort of uh, biogony, if you want to call it, the, the origin of life, um, you also have a metrology, and, and most of these philosophers did come up with the metrology. So, um, it, where does wind come from? So, wind, remember, is this light, dry substance, right? Uh, we already know that you know we have the air that comes from ev evaporation, from the moist element the action of the hot and dry on the moist and sort of um, cold. So this, this evaporation ca causes a flow of air, right? And um, there is always motion in the aperon, but this element, um, elements of air, uh, elements of this water are set in motion by a sort of liquefaction by the sun, right? The sun sort of liquefies, the, uh, you know, this further or, or evaporates, whichever way you want to think of it, and and then, and that's how you get wind, right? It's it's the wind is caused by the sun, in shorter sort of terms. Rain, rain comes from evaporation from the earth and by the sun's action, right? Uh, rain, remember, is this heavy wet substance, so so you can see it's the opposite of the light dry substance, wind and rain. Um, then you have thunder and lightning, so which he explained via a conflict of wind and the rain clouds. So you can see this combination here with, um, you know, you have um, a cosmogony, you know, we the origin of the earth, then you have metrology, you have biology. You can see that he tried to create a complete system and, and you know, try to explain, you know, different phenomena of what we observe in, in the world uh, via the, these few notions, you know, so one notion was the aperon, the aperon as <coughs> the the one single substance that constitutes all the opposites, which is in constant motion, and then the idea of separating out and conflict and retribution and change and balance. So, you know, when we title this lecture Matter, Motion and the Cosmos, I think Anaximander really, really sort of, you know, um, it, it illustrates this title that, you know, we are talking about, you know, the original material, what is matter, you know, in the first place, motion, how does it move, what are the causes of motion, and cosmos, and how is the cosmos formed by the movement of matter in a certain pattern, by certain laws, and what, what are laws even, you know, and uh, cos laws are what form the cosmos, you know, even though it, they look like conflict in this case, but they are the formation of the cosmos is via these sort of, these laws, uh, you know, and in that sense, this, this not law, but more in his case, this justice, you know, this justice that is enacted uh, by, you know, uh, you know, different parts of that element through this, and in some ways, a archaic primeval notion of justice, you know, there's this notion of justice that's there from the beginning, you know, this is, justice itself is an arche in that sense. You know, you have, you know, the, the arche of the aperon contains within it the notion of justice. Yeah? All right, then, thank you.